And I want to ask the question before I start. The first question is, is there anyone in this room that is already retired? Show of hands. Okay, is there anyone in this room that wants to retire? Actually, really aims to retire? <laughs> Simon's got his hand up big time there. <clears throat> is there anyone in this room who doesn't want to retire, that feels that they'd rather work you know, right until they can't? Anyone in the room? <laughs> okay, excellent. I'm going to ask you to indulge me a bit, please, and to allow yourself to swim in the sea of your imagination. Sounds like I've been reading too many Harry Potter books. But anyway, so imagine that you are 300 years old, and you're standing in your bathroom, and you're looking back at yourself in the mirror, and you're contemplating the blessings of gravity. And your spouse walks in. I notice I didn't use a gender there. I just said spouse. And she wishes you, whoops, <laughs> she wishes you a happy 250th wedding anniversary. And you, for, a, for a, a brief moment, what goes through your mind is, wow, what do you call a 250th wedding anniversary? Is that like five golds? Is that more golds than some of the Olympic swimmers? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, maybe it's madness. Maybe you call it madness. And this is what goes through your mind. And another thing that goes through your mind is, oh, it's an entrepreneurial thought. So you've had two thoughts and you're 300 years old and you think, wow, that's amazing. To have two, two thoughts at 300 is a marvel. I haven't had that before. But what goes through your mind is another use for steam irons to try and remove the wrinkles. So joking aside, <clears throat> this is actually where scientists believe we are going. And we are going to unpack that in this talk. We're going to unpack what is going to happen with our aging process and how we actually plan for it. A uh, very interesting topic. So let's look, let's look at the history of retirement first. Where did it start? And as Simon alluded to earlier, it actually started in the late 1880s. Uh, Mr. Or Otto von Bismarck actually promulgated it into a social security system. And the reason why he did that was he was concerned that the Marxists were going to take over Europe. So he introduced this pension scheme to people. But what he did was he said, you can have a pension, but you have to be 65 to receive it. Now, in those days, most people died at 45. And manual labor was what dominated the environment. So he knew his promise was pretty empty. It was a political decision. That's basically what he did. In the early 1900s, this developed a bit further. So what happened was you had interest groups getting involved in, in the, in the decision-making process, business, politicians, and what they did was they drove younger people into the, the employment market and tried to move older people out. And this is where we had the start of such things as pension schemes within corporate environments. In, 19, in the 1930s, Roosevelt then promulgated into America, into the social security system, uh, a, you know, a retirement package. And you can see there, in, in 1937, there were about 20 workers paying an annual tax of $30, and that supported one person. By 2011, we actually had two people paying in $15,000 a year to support one person. And in certain countries in the world, this has gone the other way. We know that they can't fund. So we're going to talk about what's happened with retirement ages. And I think when we, when we acknowledge that things have changed in the environment, in the early days of pension funds, we had, first of all, Bismarck saying, well, I'll give you money out of the state. And then suddenly in the Americans saying, well, listen, you must fund your own retirement. And we had corporates actually turning around and saying, well, to attract you, the youth, we are going to introduce a pension scheme. And in those days, it was known as a defined benefit fund. And for those of you that don't understand what that is, it was a promise of a pension when you retired. And it sat on the balance sheet of the, the corporate, and effectively, you were, you, were, you were guaranteed your pension if it was in your employment contract. That has changed. There's very few of those left today, if, if not any. And now what we have is what we call the defined contribution fund. We fund our own retirement effectively. Yes, the employer does fund towards it. So that's been the development uh, of, of pensions in the world. And what's also happened is we've, we've learned to live longer. We've learned, learned to understand what makes us age. And if you look at some of these stats, they're frightening. There is a Dr. Aubrey de Grey, if you ever want to look him up uh, on the internet, he talks about, he's a professor, 
and he's a, obviously these scientists have got together and, and, and studied. They've identified 60 genes in the human body that cause aging. And effectively, what they're saying is that the first person born, sorry, the first person to live to 150 is born already. They're living already. 20 years after that person dies, someone will live to 1,000. That's insane, I know. It's hard to even conceive. And the kids born from 2033 will live to 300 and 400 years old. So that changes the landscape quite considerably, doesn't it, in how we plan. Obviously, for all of us, it might not be as long. We're ready in the world. But the reality is that for a lot of us, we will live longer. And for the kids born, the, the age expect, uh, life expectancy is around 100, 104, 105. That's what they're considering now. So the kids being born right now. So it's, it's quite an interesting uh, fact. The other thing we've done is, you know, if you look at skin grafts, for example, we have 3D printers. You can print skin onto burn victims. We have molds that you can have printed in dentist's rooms, you know, to fix your teeth. We've actually even gone and studied cor the coral reefs and reverse engineered what they do to protect themselves from the sun and put it into a pill. That's about to be launched. So we'll have a pill that stops us from having the effects of, of the sun. This is where, we've, where we are. Now these are remarkable stats and things we have to really consider in our planning process. If you think about it, you're gonna live 300, 400 years. What do you do, first of all? Just what do you do with your time? The world will change considerably. Uh, you know, maybe the first hundred years you study. <laughs> We're gonna have a lot more professors <laughs> and, and very full universities. But this is a reality. I was, I was presenting this before and someone actually commented in the audience that the natural order of things would restore that. It's, it's, it's too beyond what you know, we can conceive. And something will come, someone actually commented Ebola's here. Uh, maybe if that's what you think. But I think what we've got to do is we can't put our heads in the sand about this. We can't put our heads in the sand about it as people investing. And we can't, as an industry, we, have to, we also have to be cognitive of this and, and advise people correctly. So people are going to live longer. And a lot of people are also not going to, and, they, and this is already happening, people do not save enough. And obviously, inflation eats into their, into their investments. The rule of 72, I've just put this here because it's actually quite a nice tool for people to use very simply. Literally, all you do is you take an inflation rate. So if the inflation rate, for example, is 6% now, you divide it into 72, and that'll give you a number, 12. And that's effectively... That 12 years is a number of years will take you to halve your money and value. Okay, and if you're looking at the other way around, it, it's if you've got a six percent return on your money and you divide it into 72, it'll take you 12 years to double your money. That's how the rule of 72 works. Uh, if you want to double your money in every five years, you need about 14.8 percent return. So it just gives you an idea of what to look at. So when you when you're talking about inflation, this is a big big thing that people do not cater for properly. We do not start young enough investing, and truly, uh, you know, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. There's no doubt about that. We have to, co we have to cater for it, start early. How do we, what, what else can we consider in this process? Well, what about, what about having a purpose-driven life? Uh, we, some of us would have heard of this. People wake up in the morning sometimes and go to work and they don't really want to be there. They aren't really purpose-driven. And in my experience in this industry, I've come across a number of people who retire and they actually feel very disconnected from what they had before and the life they had. And what ends up happening is there's a fair level of disheartenment, sometimes even depression. And so that kind of thing has to be considered in the process. In other words, what we could do is possibly live longer, uh, sorry, work longer. Now, I know our systems are not set up like that. We, we've been sold the idea of retirement from a very young age. And your employment contract says it's 65, cheerio. But that's starting to change in the world too. And the purpose-driven life is really, a, it's out of philosophy and, and religion. There's a lot of different philosophies that talk about this. Starting life and actually doing something that, really, that you're really passionate about and that you can actually do for the, the whole of your life and possibly earn from it as well. So what about that? I mean, maybe we can factor that into it. Maybe that changes how we plan. Maybe we don't, and, and maybe we think that if we live a purpose-driven life and we can work right till the day that we can't anymore, almost to the end of our lives, maybe our planning process changes. Do we need to accumulate as much? Do we? 
And we'll talk about that a little bit f further on. So maybe what is going to happen is we're going to become a, a more of a community-based world. And this is already starting to happen in the world where employment agencies are starting to pop up where they employ people over 65. That's their focus. And all they do is they synergize those elders with the youth in a, in a working environment. So there's a com combination of wisdom and experience and energy. I think it's shocking that we cast aside our wisest and most knowledgeable. I think it's shocking. And it's a, I'm very passionate about it. Uh, I think we, we've got to change that system. There's a company in Ameri uh, sorry, in Canada called Cineplex, like our Stair Clinical. They do not employ anyone on the basis of age. You just, if you could do the job, you do it. And I was watching a program on it, actually. It was interesting to see this 85-year-old man with more passion and energy than some of his 25-year-old colleagues because he was so happy to have a job. The other part of, of, of um, this kind of thinking and, and, and purpose is that they have, they have actually investigated the Western, uh, sorry, tribes that are not affected by the Western world. So the outlying tribes in the world to see why they live so long because that was the main factor behind it. Why are these people living so long? And the main reason why they could, what they could, could find is that they actually wake up every day with something to do. So these 105, 110-year-old people have something to do. You know, moving clouds, bringing in rain, whatever it is. They have a reason to be there. Um, so you can see that in the UK, um, Mary, Mary Portis has said, okay, I'm going to start this channel, and we, we're not going to cast aside our elders anymore. And it's certainly happening everywhere in the world, and I think it's vital that we start embracing this concept. So it starts changing also our planning process because perhaps we can now become consultants, and that's also happening in I, I, we experience it every day. People are leaving work and coming back as consultants. And that's important. I think that's that's also going to change. And you can see here just what you see um, Daily Mail in the UK. One in 10 people aged over 65 has a job, up from one in 2020 and 1993. Gives you an idea of where we stand in terms of uh, employment and the changes in, that, in the thinking. So everything is going to change. In our thinking processes and in the planning that we have in the businesses in the world, we have to accept that. But let's, with everything that I've said, let's assume or let's let's agree that we still probably need to plan for retirement. Let's let's agree that, and that's certainly what we're advocating. So yes, you might decide I'm going to work until I die, but or until I can't anymore. But you might live another 15 years after you can't anymore. So we have to plan for it. And I think that there's two reasons why you would want to do that. One of them is part of the, the values that we, we learn in life is responsibility. And responsibility with money is one of them. And the other is, is obviously your, your, your long-term planning process is important. So rather, as John Keynes has said, it's a bit out of context, but I'd rather be approximately right than exactly wrong. Rather plan for it and know that you're in a position to, to, to live through that process. So now that we've agreed that, yes, we should, be, we should be planning for retirement or the day that we choose to st step away from working, let's look at softer issues in this process. What behavioral issues do we need to consider when we are now long-term planners, when we are planning for retirement? Sorry, can you see? Am I getting in the way of the... Are you okay? And what this... What, what this slide tells you is behavioral science is, in fact, the, the man who's done, who put this forward is a guy called Lawrence Schliebusch. He's a, a Natal professor. He's from he's homegrown. Um, he put this um, method forward and all this way of thinking, and I've adapted it a little bit. But we are, we are taught from an early age that we're going to retire. So that's our thinking process, and that's a perception that grows with us through our life. Some people, some people go through life with fear of it. And some people go through life with this absolute um, excitement that this is going to be this most euph euphoric period. I think both don't hit it, the nail on the head <laughs> because you don't need to fear it, but you also, I don't think it's as picture perfect as everyone says it is. It could possibly be. There are issues that arise out of retirement. But effectively, how our thinking works is generally speaking, we think first. So we start with a thought, which then moves into an emotion. 
So thought, oh, am I going to have enough money? Fear, emotion, oh, and then you behave. And if that behavior is misguided because you're doing it out of fear, or it's based on fear, what can end up happening is you could actually make silly decisions. And that's generally what happens in our, in our marketplace. You have people acting out of greed and fear. That's often what happens in our marketplace. And these actually bounce back on each other, and you can end up spiraling uh, in, your, in your thinking process. So what you really need when you're planning for retirement or, or managing money is you need partners. You really need that. You need specialists, planners, those kinds of people that can you can even just bounce ideas off because they are going to help you to control your emotions and manage them. And when those emotions are maybe a bit misguided, they will help you with that. That's important, even if it's just someone you talk to, but there must be a trained person, someone who is a specialist. Really, we encourage that that is something you do. All right, so how do we have a financially wrinkle-free retirement? How do we do that? Well, we'll start with the end in sight. And what I mean by that is what you want to try and do is plan as if it's today. And just to simply explain, if you're going to retire today, what's, what sort of income would you want? Uh, wealth planners do this kind of job. Uh, that's part of the basis of what they do. What kind of income are you going to want? Um, what assets do you currently have that can go into the pot towards that? What are you going to need to save? And how much return are you going to have to achieve to achieve that goal that you want? You, you, you want? But what is most important about this whole, whole planning process is that you get your asset allocation correct. Asset allocation is actually 94% of the driver behind return. That's the most important thing. Not, not too many people know that. So you might have a lot of investments, but how are they allocated? And are they actually achieving or, or going to achieve the results that you want, that return you need? And what you really need to do too is rebalance that investment continually. So let's say we have an asset allocation, I'll just talk very simply, of 50% in the stock market and 50% in property, listed property, which is obviously listed on the market too. Uh, end of the first year, that's changed to 65 and, and, and 35. The idea is that you rebalance back to the 50-50 because that's the perfect asset allocation for the performance you need or the return you need. Now, that's hard for people to do if you think about it because the reason why, let's say the equity is up at 65%, the reason why it's there is because it's done well. And emotionally, we don't want to go away from something that's doing well. We actually want to move into it. There's, there are some wealth planners in this room, and they'll know what I mean by this. So, so investors will look and say, that fund's doing well, but that's not doing well. That's the one I want. And in actual fact, if you've got your asset allocation right and you've picked your funds right, what you need to do is re rebalance back. But the herd doesn't do that. The herd goes the other way. So it's fantastic that you're in this room because you want the education to know that this is – and you might obviously know of this anyway. But it's very important that we, we consider that. So now we've, we've, we've decided you know, what we need to do in terms of saving. And just a couple of other points. Um, for every million rand that you have, that produces about 5,000 rand a month for a 20-year period. And, and it produces that with an inflationary increase. Okay, so I'm talking about current economic terms. So the inflation rates now, interest rates now. And that's a fairly conservative estimate, but it gives you an idea of how much money you need to accumulate to, to, get, to provide you 20 years of income. And at the end of 20 years, everything's gone. So that's how that, that equation works. Uh, the other thing is that when you're planning for retirement, what you also need to understand is that a lot of the retirement vehicles that you buy are limited by a regulation in the Pensions Fund Act. It's called Regulation 28. And what that does is it, it, it limits the, the amount of equity you can have in that, in that portfolio. It limits you to 75% in, in shares. Uh, you can have 25% in property, but a combination of the two, you can only have 90%. So when you're planning, please bear that in mind because you actually could be underperforming your goals because of that. I believe retirement annuities are fantastic vehicles, especially the, 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 the new age retirement annuities. They're unitized. You can actually even have share portfolios in them. So they're actually well worth having. But... Please understand that. And pension funds, corporate pension funds, 
are going to make sure that they're fairly conservative in, the, in, in how they uh, uh, invest your money. The trustees are under huge pressure, lots of risk. So they are going to make sure that as you get closer to retirement, your risk drops off. But, I mean, if you retire at 65 and live to 95, you've actually got another 30 years. So why drop your risk so much? Look, once again, you've got to speak with your wealth planner because it's, 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 it's person-specific, but you have to consider those factors. So let's look at how we can invest now. Let's look at put, putting our plan in place to, to, to invest for the long term. We've agreed now that, yes, we're going to live longer. Uh, we've agreed that uh, you know, possibly we'll live for a long period of time, but we can also work longer, but we still need to plan. If you look at the active and passive way of investing, now this is very hotly debated at the moment. Simon and I were actually talking briefly about it, but active managers, which is where Canon Asset Managers fits in the picture, what we do is we invest money in a specific style, which I'll explain to you a bit further on. And our goal is to try and beat a benchmark. That's our goal, that's what you pay us for. All right, you must understand that a lot of the active managers in the world do not beat their benchmarks. So they don't often, or don't always add value. Uh, there's times when it's really high. In other words, 80% of the active managers do not. But sometimes it's 40, 50% uh, of the active managers who do not. So you need to find managers that do beat those, their benchmarks. And their, their idea is to add value to your life. So that's an active manager. You then have the passive management style. And that's you know, investing in such things as Satrix 40, or the Satrix funds, Swindy, Indy. The Satrix portfolios are trackers. So they track the top 40 stocks. And the understanding behind that is that you will not beat those 40. You'll always track them. There is still a fee that you pay to the, 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 the tracker fund. And sometimes there's a slight tracking error in that. In other words, the fund managers battles to keep up exactly with holding those exact stocks because of the money coming in and out. It's quite hard to manage it. And what you can do is you can have a combination of the two in your portfolios. So you could have some trackers, some active. A lot of people do that now. So they might have 60% passive investment or trackers and the, and the rest active managers. But some points just to think about. The Satrix 40 is an example. At any one time, if there's a sector in that Satrix that's dominant, let's say the resource sector, what you're actually doing is you're buying a passive investment, but you're making an active decision on holding resources. Something you've got to consider. Uh, and also, I mean, in theory, a lot of that, that top 40 will be large cap based, obviously, but it will be often growth based. And I'll explain a little bit more about the different styles, growth investing and value investing now. So just something to consider. Then if we look at the, at the styles of investing, so now you've decided okay, you, you make your decision on how you want to invest. I'm an active investor, I'm a passive. I'd like both in my portfolio. I'd like to run some of my own shares, which a lot of you will probably be doing. Let's look at how asset managers manage money. And I'm going to focus mainly on growth value and growth at a reasonable price, which is what GARP is. Uh, but I'll explain quickly just what all of them are. A growth asset manager is someone who buys a share that's increasing in earnings above the sector that it's in, or the market. That's what a growth manager looks for. A value manager is someone or a company that looks to, to buy, invest in stocks that pay good dividends, and the stocks are inexpensive relative to real value. Okay, that's what a value manager does. A growth at a reasonable price manager is somewhere in between. So a growth at a reasonable price manager is someone who looks for long-term average, in, uh, above average, sorry, uh, earnings growth but does not buy stocks that have high valuations. So that's what a growth at a reasonable price manager investor. Momentum is literally a manager that buys when, uh, when the market's up, going up, and sells when the market's going down. And then you get stock picking, and you could say stock breaking fits in that, and then style rotators. So style rotators would be sometimes managers that move between the three, or particularly the first two. And these are some of the people that uh, are represented in the world. That's, and we'll know some of the names. Uh, we might, some of you might have heard of George Soros, uh, one of the, the big growth managers, very wealthy man. You might have heard of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, they're partners. Warren Buffett's very well known. So Warren Buffett's business 
uh, Berkshire Hathaway is a, is a growth at a reasonable price business. Actually, he wasn't always growth at a reasonable price. He was a value manager at, at some point. I think he just, just got so much money now. <laughs> He's moved. Uh, and then we have the value managers. And the forefathers of value investing were Benjamin Graham and David Dodd. Uh, we were going to be cheeky and put Adrian Saville in here. He's our chief investment officer. We, just, we thought we'd leave him out this time. Uh, Adrian's quite shy. But at the end of the day, these are the different, the main styles that exist in investing. Now I'm going to just focus quickly a little on value and, and, and growth as styles. Because even when you're buying an individual stock, you can identify whether it's a value stock or a growth stock just by what it's made up of in terms of its metrics, which is things such as price earnings, dividend yield, that sort of thing. What this, what this slide talks about mostly is the fact that styles are cyclical. So what we've done here, if you look on the vertical axis, all we've done is we've taken a three-year rolling period. So each point represents three years back on the slide. And literally, we've compared value to growth on the slide. I attempt to show you wrinkles in the style side of things, just to keep in the theme of the talk. But effectively, what we're saying here is if you look here, value in 2001 outperformed growth by 60%. That's effectively what it's saying. And if you look all the way along the slide, you can see there is definitely a cycle here. Not, not easy to pick a cycle, not easy to say what the cycle is or when it is. In fact, if you can, please tell us how. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, it's easy in hindsight. And this is the global chart. So same thing again. We've, we've, we have three eroding alpha, and alpha is just literally outperformance relative to the other, or a benchmark. So literally, that's what it means. And you can see along the way that it's a very cyclical thing. So when you're investing money, you might be a person who likes value or value kind of share more than you like growth. It just it might interest you more or it might resonate more with you. Maybe you've got to consider that both are good. Maybe you've got to consider that. That maybe both fit into your portfolio. In other words, you blend. Yes, you're going to, you're going to smooth your return that way. The value style of investing historically has performed the, the best. That's the history of it. But it doesn't do it every year. And so, yeah, and we do find that people are... I mean, we, a lot of us get impatient. If you can be patient, sure, you can live it out. But what happens if you need money out of your investment and you're in value and it's not performing or you're in growth and it's not performing? What are you going to do? You're going to get impatient. It's going to hurt you. Now, in some instances, the blend that you have in these two, if you blend them, some instances, one and one makes three. Some instances it does. It depends on what you've, you've blended. So you might decide, well, I want 60% value, 40%. Uh, growth. That might be your blend, but that's up to you to decide. Now let's talk about two stocks because this really highlights the difference between what a value manager and a growth manager would be trying to identify. We all know BMW, very well known. Um, and what we've done here is we've just said, right, here's its enterprise value, here's its revenue relative to another stock called Tesla. Anyone heard of Tesla in the room? Elon Musk. Homegrown billionaire, wonderful guy. I mean, amazing what he's done. And the story is so amazing. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of history, or, or, or you might know some of the facts, but I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about him now. He was the co-founder, said to be co-founder of PayPal. He's also the co-founder of SpaceX. SpaceX have actually developed the first rocket that go, can go into space and come back and land. So you can imagine the, the drop in cost. And NASA's saying, thank you very much. We'll, we'll have a few of those. And then he, and then he starts with Tesla. Uh, Tesla is the electric car, but it's an electric car that's like a sports car. And at one point, you paid $70,000 for this car. So that's a lot of money. Half of it was in the batteries. What he's done is he said, OK, I'll sort that out. He's building a, a, a gigafactory. Uh, I think it's in Nevada. And It'll produce more batteries, lithium-ion batteries, than any, than any place in the world. In fact, what the world's produced. And he's going to drop the cost of his car down to $35,000. That's what he's trying to do. So it's a wonderful story. Um, BMW, on the other hand, a few years ago, 18 months ago, it, it sold more Rolls Royces than it's ever done. In a world economy that's battling. Quite interesting. Where did they sell them to? Asia. So... Interestingly enough, that 
if you look at if you look at those stories, uh, you know, Elon Musk has said, "I'm going to open." He has power stations all over the, the place. You can go in and you can recharge your car uh, for free. It's built into the cost of the car. He's opened them in America. He expects to employ six and a half thousand people in his lithium-ion uh, factory. Uh, there's a number of things that he's going to do. Now let's look at the numbers. Okay. You look here, uh, BMW. That's, many, that's how many vehicles it's produced. That's what Tesla's produced. Earnings before interest, tax, and depreciation. Don't worry too much about that, but the earnings. 19.1 billion versus 32 million. Net income, 7.3 billion versus 1.5 million. Price earnings, and I'll, I'll, go in, I'll just explain price earnings quickly for those of you who don't know it. But price earnings is pretty low here. There's no meaningful price earnings here because they made a loss. And earnings is part of the price earnings ratio. So, and if you look at the share price, I've been watching it for the last week. It's been interesting. BMW is hovering around 90 euros. Tesla has gone from 262 dollars to $288. So the story is still great. People are buying that story. So that's the difference between a growth and a value stock. Okay. What people expect here is lots of earnings. Price has been driven already. And that's what, that what, so you need to understand that if you're going to invest, you, ha, you actually want to have, and you like Tesla, make sure you also have BMW. <laughs> you, need to, you need to expect that things will change. The next thing you've got to look for in your long-term investing plan is sentiment. Um, and that's not to be confused with sediment, which is all you have left. Generally, all you have left if you only invest with sentiment. <laughs> you need to apply some facts to you. To what you what you're doing but look at this slide here's the south african market our top 40 stocks and you can see uh, in the 12 last 12 months you see a drop in profits in those top 40 stocks of almost 10 percent but an increase in price earnings or basically price okay and then you look at the small cap index that's basically the top end top 60 stocks in the all share index all share index just so you know it's made up of 160 stocks okay and you see here, you have um, a, a almost 20% increase in profits, but a drop in PEs or in, in, in price and earnings. So what that's telling you is be careful that you, do, you, don't, that you avoid this just because of noise and sentiment. Be careful of that. Make sure that you look at both and decide which ones work for you, what, what resonates for you. And this is now a 36-month uh, chart and it's really very similar but it gives you the same idea we've had a lot of run in our market and it's been in the, in the, the high growth stocks in, in, in the last few years the next thing you want to do is make sure you diversify properly this is a very interesting slide because if you look at the first three stocks here Nusbers, Richemont and SAB Miller last year so this is showing you 2013 last year's market produced 21 just over 21 percent including dividends Take dividends out of it, about 18%. Okay, that's what you got out of the all share index. So if you'd invested in them in the in all share index. But three stocks, those three contributed 11% of that 18%. So if you didn't have those three, you got 7%. 7%. So what you want to know is you make sure you diversify properly because that's quite risky. Great companies, excellent companies. I mean, they've done some amazing things. I suppose his recent results are also very good. And if you look here, and I'll just explain this. Do anyone, does anyone not know what price earnings means in the room? You all understand it? Uh, it's just a multiple. And effectively, what we're saying is if a share is worth, it's trading at 20 Rand, it's earnings for that share are two, is 2 Rand, your multiple is price over earnings is, t is 10. Okay. So what, and that means nothing in isolation. What that's, what's telling you is the market's prepared to pay 10 times earnings. But when you, when you look at it relative to its own history or to its sector, that's when it starts becoming important as a filtering tool for a share. Uh, one year trailing price earnings is maybe not as effective. There's lots of other tools that you would use, but the worldwide average is about 16. And every sector and every stock will have different averages, but the worldwide average is about 16. So what that's saying to you is, if the price earnings is below 16, it's starting to become inexpensive and above it is expensive. 
if you look here, you can see that the all share index price earnings in January 2013 was 14.8. It jumped up to 18.6 in January 2014, an increase of 25.7. So the market had driven the price up, but earnings hadn't followed. That's what that's saying to you. And then I'd like to talk about this, the cyclically adjusted price earnings, because that's a metric um, that we use a lot in our, in, in what we, in our work uh, as value managers. What we do there is we don't just take price over, over last year's earnings, okay, which is what the price earnings ratio is, we take price over seven years earnings, we average that earnings out and we inflate it and we put it under current price. So you can imagine if you're looking at seven years of earnings, it's a much better indicator of the DNA of that stock. It's a through the cycle look. And it comes from Graham and Dodd, who I, alluded, uh, I spoke about earlier. So it's important to understand that those metrics tell you stories. Uh, return on equity, I won't go into too much detail. It's effectively how well the company employs the shareholders' investment. And it's a measure of quality of a share. And you can see that the, j just those stocks drop by 10.8% in quality in, the, in that year. So make sure you diversify because you want to make sure that you're getting the best of all markets. This slide, although it might look quite complicated, it's, it's also the all share index, but it's 20 years of data. You can see the market sits in the middle there. And what we've done is we said, let's break the all share index down into a value sector, a growth sector, and a growth at a reasonable price sector. And we use certain metrics to do that, and they all got the same metrics. At the end of the day, the market sits here. So, and this is a real return, so it's above inflation, okay? And you can see the market sitting receiving around 23%. Uh, sorry, around 8% uh, real return with a volatility of about 23. And you then see the different styles of investing. If you're a value manager, okay, or a value investor, your best return is coming from small cap value shares. Okay, that's your best return is coming from. In fact, if you look down here, it shows you what it did over the 20 years. Cumulative real return. 2,310%. So that's where, you, where your, most, your best return comes from. But please, look at the volatility. Remember that's there too. So the money's often in the mid and small caps. Most of the market actually invests in the large caps. That's interesting enough. So once again, you want some diversification. Uh, yes, you could argue that's all I want. <laughs> look at the result. Uh, that's, not, that's not what we're saying. We're saying that's where the money is. Make sure you've got some of it in your portfolio. And diversification amongst countries is also important. So what you want to try and do is, is make sure that you understand the CAPE ratios of the regions. And what we did here is we said, okay, let's remember CAPE, the CAPE ratio, once again, is seven-year earnings under the current price. And we've, we've, we've said, okay, let's look at the different countries in the world. The gray bar represents where this CAPE ratio has been for each of these countries. So at one point, Greece's CAPE ratio was 40. When you consider the average around 16, that means it was expensive. Okay, way above its, its historical average. So all that's happened is earnings have stayed constant, but price has been driven up in that market, and it's become more expensive. Look at Japan. Its highest point was over 90. So effectively, what that was saying was the market was prepared to pay 90 times earnings for that country, which is actually insane. But that's the case. So, and then if we look at South Africa in current terms, um, our market is sitting around just under 20 as a, in a, as a CAPE ratio. Okay, so that's actually fairly expensive relative to its historical average. But it's been pulled up by one sector or one half of a sector of our market, large cap industrials. That's the sector that's pulling the market up. I mean, you saw those three stocks that produced the return. You take those out of the picture. It's quite a different story. And South African financials are actually sitting at about fair value, and resources, there's great opportunity in it. Okay, so when you're investing for the long term, you need to diversify. You need to diversify between styles. You need to understand what those styles are, maybe. And that's where you use professionals and your own research. You also need to look at countries. You know, Greece could be a great place to invest. Maybe not in not in any companies that Greece 
uh, that Greece derives its income from only from Greece. Maybe that's not a good idea. You want it to be deriving its income from outside of Greece, but could be a great place to invest. And then really to drum home the understanding of information. And I think this is a wonderful forum for people to learn more from. But this information is something that not everyone uh, will, will receive. And it actually tells a, big, a really big story. Once again, we've put CAPE ratio on this vertical scale, and the timeline is here. And we've, we've pitched, the line graph pitches the one-year trailing price earnings against the CAPE ratio historically over that period. And you can see what the mean is. So it's around 16, as I've said. So that's your, 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 your mean number. In 2008, we had a financial crisis, didn't we? And people ran for the hills. If you didn't know what the CAPE ratio was and you were only looking at price earnings, you would have thought the market was at fair value. Because look at, look at where it was. It was around its average. So people were still jumping into the market. And it's euphoria. That's, what it, that's basically what it is. People were still jumping in. However, if you had actually been able to identify that the CAPE ratio was way above, there's a big gap here. You might have approached it differently. And how would you do that? Well, you've got to, you've got to interact with people that, are, that have the knowledge. Um, and there's a lot of information you know, that you can garner from websites, these kinds of talks. So we really encourage you to engage with people. But this really tells a story. And this is a current slide of where our sectors are right now. Uh, what we've done is we've said, okay, let's, let's use the CAPE ratio even further, but let's now look at those sectors and see what they've done over time. Um, and you can see once again, um, the red, what we did was we took the, the industrial sector and we broke it down into mid and small and large cap industrials. And you can see the industrial sector is very highly priced. Okay, now we don't know what's going to happen from there, but let's look at what's happened with resources and financials. You know, there's a long lead up, but boy, when it changes, it changes fairly quickly. So, you know, hopefully it doesn't do that. Maybe just earnings catch up, but, you know, we don't want to see a big change in the market. We don't think, at the moment, the world is, uh, is bipolar in its view. America is considered to be coming out of the doldrums. Employ unemployment rates are dropping. Uh, it's improving. And then um, South Africa is, is sitting with a few labor issues, a few challenges, our markets is not completely following America. But others are saying, no, America is overpriced. You know, that's the, the, um, honestly, there's a bipolar view. Uh, we, we believe that we are not in a p position where it's, th it's that bad. I mean, there's no euphoria. There's no economist saying, wow. Everyone's going, no, this is hard. You know, this is a tough period. Everyone's talking about depressed markets. So we don't see a big, uh, a big drawdown in the marketplace. But... For your long-term planning and, and for any client's long-term planning, it's very important to understand that this information gives you a lot to work with when you're, doing your, when you're in your planning process. And the last thing that we must, we must remember is that big does not stay big forever. And this slide really tells, you, tells the story, and, and it goes back to the passive investing, the top 40 shares. Out of the, out of, in 1990, out of the 40 stocks, the top 40 stocks, today only eight remain in that top 40. Some of them have been leapfrogged, and some are gone. So I think, I mean, you know, the, the old adage of put it in the cupboard and go away, buy and put it in the cupboard, you know, you, maybe you just need a little bit, you don't put your head in the sand completely with that. But it really tells the story that we, we need to, I think, be engaging with this, this kind of planning process on a regular basis. Uh, yes, uh, you know, you could throw six darts at the share page and maybe you would do okay, but maybe two of them would cut of business. <laughs> I don't think you want to do that. So this is where we sit in terms of, of planning. Um, Canon Asset Managers is a value manager. We fit one of those spaces. Uh, we, we use metrics like the CAPE ratio a lot, and we ask you and, uh, to engage, not just with us, but all professionals. Get to understand a bit more about it. You know, attending these talks is fantastic because you learn more from them. 
So in the long run, whether you choose to not to stop working at 65, whether you choose to work until you can't anymore, just make sure that when you plan, that you plan with a goal in mind, that you get your asset allocation really accurate, and that you rebalance regularly, that you use people to help you get out of your own way when the times are bad. In other words, when you want to bail out and you probably shouldn't be, use people in the industry to help you with that. Speak to them. Let them guide you through the process. Let them remind you of the plan that you put in place. And if you're an individual shareholder, use this talk and the things that we've, we, we can learn out of value and growth managing to buy your own stocks. Understand that there are different styles in it uh, and have a long-term view. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions?